Willkommen, meine Freunde, to the swirling mists of Top 40 time. To Top 40s, which are broad, sunlit uplands, and others, which are, to be frank, pure ghetto. And this week, we will walk on that dark and dingy side as the Top 10 for the week ending 28th of June, 1990. Kicking off this week's stink fest is step by step from the new kids on the block. A record which is, at best, innocuous, and by later standards in this video, innocuous will become a fairly mild term of reference. Blandly and occasionally adenoidally sung, if artfully arranged, the record seems to aspire to being a cheeky disco throwback, but it misses. Too much of the then popular clutter and clank production style dims the impact of the silky strings. On the whole, one can't help but think the song is really just a tool to push a music video, rather than the other way around. And therein lies the problem. It's difficult to write about Top 40 music when the Top 40 in question bears no correspondence between the songs on it and one's personal station in life. I always thought the reason that I couldn't listen to new music in the first half of the 90s was because pop was crap and grunge music was an insult to my intelligence, but the degree of cold disconnect I feel between myself and this record and my feeling of having nothing in common with anyone who, for their own reason, cherishes it either as an artifact or as a memory of the time, probably shows that the relationship between me and what the music world wanted had vanished a year before the artless caterwauling of the sad wiggle boys took over the radio. But the margins were fine, and the next record shows why. Number 9 is the shining jewel of the top 10, as it had been for 11 weeks beforehand, including 5 of them at number 1, Vogue by Madonna. The song which ended the first golden phase of her career and her reign as indisputably the biggest star on the planet, and heralded her own largely disappointing 90s, it remains her biggest ever hit, selling 6 million copies plus worldwide, and if not the best single she ever made, certainly one of the very best. Sleek yet punchy, this was the last great cannonade of 80s pop, before the volume wars and robotic rattle of modern dance music took over. Number 8 is the possibly overtitled I Don't Want to Be With Nobody But You, a one hit once off for Australian supergroup Absent Friends, made up of members of the Models, In Excess, and the then hot super singer Wendy Matthews. Make no mistake about it, Matthews is a stunning singer and she's full forefront and centre across this slab of pop soul that smokes and smoulders its way across its airtime. It's not really memorable, but it is a song that is always pleasant to revisit when it comes up on an oldie station or memory takes you to chase it down. Number 7 is Spin That Wheel from Belgian house music troupe High Tech 3. Belgian? Seriously? Uh, is there even such a thing as Belgium? Is it, is it real or is it just a place parents tell their kids they'll send them if they're naughty? Or where very good footballers say they're from so they can form a team that crashes out of tournament semi-finals every two years? Surely it's just the northern suburbs of France or South Holland. Why am I talking about this? So I don't have to talk about this shitty record. It's boring, headache inducing and has a rap on it which demonstrates amply why rap was still considered juvenile novelty music at this point. Fortunately, so-called Belgium was to give us a few good bands in Deus and Admiral Freebie, etc. in the late 90s, early 2000s, which redeemed its musical reputation somewhat. Number six is a professionally crafted blanditude, a pap pop Pabulum, a cannily crafted confection that came from an album that sold 10 million copies, had five top five singles in the US and one Billboard's record of the year. That record, of course, is Hold On by Wilson Phillips, a spectacularly unthreatening amalgam of two of Brian Wilson's daughters, Carney and Wendy, and China Phillips, who was the daughter of Mamas and Papas singer and noted drug maniac John Phillips. I mean, this must have been a record that spoke to people in some profound way, or bore harmonies that cradled the sensibilities in fragile moments. But 10 million records? I mean, good luck to them. But treat the irony gingerly. The two Wilsons girls say boo with a 10 million selling album, and their old dad's most famous work, Pet Sounds, has sold barely 2 million. Hold on or hang on to your ego. You decide. Before things take a decided turn for the better with number five, let us rejoice in the delights of trivia with Fowl's fantastic facts. 
The biggest mover up this week saw the parachute pants of MC Hammer jiggle into the chart for a first week debut at number 25. The album which spawned this was released 31 years ago before the term hip hop was even in common parlance and rap music as it was known then, as mentioned before, was still considered a juvenile novelty. But it remains the fifth biggest selling hip hop album, or fourth biggest if you count a double album as a single sale, of all time. Of course, if you take out posthumous albums and remove the albums by Eminem on the basis of cultural appropriation, it's the biggest selling hip hop album of all time. See, you can prove any damn thing with statistics. It hit number one on July 19th and spent four weeks sneering down on the puny wannabes from two to 40 for four weeks and becoming the second biggest hit of the year. What was the biggest hit of the year? I'll give you a clue. It was a Prince song. Paling into irrelevance is How Can We Be Lovers from the supremely irrelevant Michael Bolton, dropping from 29 to 34 after eight positively overwrought weeks on the chart. At number one in the USA this week is the heretofore weighed and found wanting step by step from the new kids on the block. In the UK, Elton John took sacrifice to the top, which in spite of all the magnificent singles he released in the 1970s, actually became his first solo number one hit. And he had it with a song that sounded like it was recorded using a Yamaha PSR2 home keyboard. The number one album in town was Beyond Salvation by the Mighty Angels, whom I'll be going to see shortly. Although it must be said this was a pale shadow. Can you have a pale shadow or is that a contradiction in terms? Of their previous glories. At number five, we find Australian icon and full-time professional cutie pie Kylie Minogue. She of the near preternatural loveliness with Better the Devil You Know which continued what was then the seemingly unstoppable juggernaut of her career. There's no seemingly about it. Kylie's career is an unstoppable juggernaut. Don't nobody be saying nothing bad about Kylie on this channel. The song that represented the arrival of the mature Kylie, it stands up today as one of her best singles and seems a fitting chart book into Madonna's Vogue for the week. By the way of trivia, this song is played at the same time, 12.30 a.m. on Saturday morning in London's famous G-A-Y nightclub. I don't know what kind of clientele that nightclub enjoys, there's no way of telling just by the name, but I'm sure given their choice of Kylie-centric ritual, they are a fun-loving and merry bunch of revelers indeed. So next time you're in London... Well, Kylie has left the building and we're back on the road ourselves to number one, having four irredeemable dung heaps to surmount on our way there. First of which is Infinity by Guru Josh, which is a little better than elevator music for people who've had one too many of the old disco biscuits. For those of us not whacked off our bonces on MDMA, the predominant sound here is of grinding repetition. Sadly, it looks like the old disco biscuits caught up with Guru Josh in the end, who sadly decided to take his own life in 2015. Vale Guru Josh, we hardly knew ya. Number three is an example of fine European craftsmanship applied to a song that sounds more like a Diane Warren ballad than any Diane Warren ballad does without actually having been written by Diane Warren. Must Have Been Love by Roxette. Machine engineered by Nordic robots to engineering tolerances comparable with a German cooktop and filled with the we care a lot, we really do cynicism of a Volvo ad, this weepy winter sing-along was appended to the feel-good movie smash of the year Pretty Woman and unleashed on a public which has, in paying good money for Guru Josh and Wilson Phillips, clearly placed the possession of music above the appreciation of it, showing it lacks the discipline or direction to resist such tooth-rottingly sweet candy. That's an 87-word run-on sentence. That's a new record. The Murrumbidgee River of this week's chart is not so much everything that is wrong with this week's chart, but just a disastrously wrong-headed record with the thin consolation that talent can eventually triumph in the form of Tina Arena's I Need Your Body. Now, Tina's story is one well-known and frankly a bit of a tired joke with music fans of a certain age, i.e. mine, in Australia. Discovered at seven by a cheesy talent show, a star at nine, going down the same path to obscurity as all the other wonder kids discovered by the show, except one Minogue K, who did all right for herself, unstoppable juggernaut, etc. An enshrinement forever as Tiny Tina, a flickering black and white trivial pursuit question. 
Five years of obscurity followed before finally getting a deal with a second rate, frankly, production organisation, decent pop ballad oriented album in 1990. And then this. Completely atypical of the album or the direction in which Arena wanted to steer her career, it seemed to be designed to fit a video narrative of the cute little nine year old is all grown up, got a out is hot for you, teenage boy or girl needing empowerment in the new naughty 90s. It's a hack record. Anyone could be singing it, and happily for Tina, she wrote it out. It took many years, but she did live this down and was back five years later with the biggest selling album in Australia in 1995, the much more mature and soulful Don't Ask. Nowadays, she sells records worldwide in four languages and can pretty much pick and choose what she wants to do. She's like that famous scene in Goodfellas. She's Tommy and she's left the shine box behind, but on the other hand, she's Billy Bats and she's proving awfully hard to kill. It's been dire so far, has it not? But take that rag away from your eyes. Now ain't the time for your tears. That will come in a few seconds after Gene plays us into the number one record in town. Bang on your drum, Gene. It's, oh dear. All I want to do is make love to you by heart. All my barbs are thrown, but I wish I'd saved even a few for this dreck, this hack work, this excrement. I mean, thus far, we've reviewed 167 songs for this series, and there's only been one so bad as to make my scoring algorithm go backwards, and this becomes the second one. What's wrong with it? Well, the song is the generic passes for rock of the era. Curiously, it's written by Mutt Lang, a guy with an irritating habit of writing annoying songs that get to number one, yet he didn't produce it, and it probably would have been better for him at the controls. That job falls to Richie Zito, the man who managed to completely derail and trash Cheap Trick around the same time. So it sounds a bit like a hair metal band trying to show their sensitive side. Except you and I know that Heart aren't a hair metal band. We know they are at Heart, a pocket Led Zeppelin capable of extremely kick-ass rock and rollery. We know that Ann Wilson was a zero bullshit lead vocalist who trimmed all the fat out of her vocals, not the breathy, moany bimbo who sings this song. The narrative of the song is incomprehensible. The production trims it with, as mentioned, every phony hair metal affectation, and the video is the same, lots of hair flicks, guitar poses in silhouette. It's a fake record, it has no soul, it doesn't resonate, it is a stain on the copybook of a band that actually had a halfway decent legacy, and it's a stain on the top 40 for this week. So that's it. Depressing, isn't it? The top 40 this week was so poor simply because it arrived at a time when the record industry now controlled the game. Apart from Prince, none of the major artists was willing to bite the hand of the companies that fed them and set them up as mini corporations. Live Aid had inadvertently demonstrated that a cosy relationship between corporate money and the traditionally self-sufficient and outlier music business was possible and the industry was torn between this pole of easy money catering for top line acts and it's having no clear idea of where the next big thing was coming from. So they bet each way. They split their attention between the high value celebrity commodity stars and the traditional model of blanketing for unknown acts, which yielded grunge and a wave of neo-folksy singer-songwriters of dubious pedigree and even more dubious quality. That gave the record industry another five or so years of good times until a combination of having to pay ridiculous money for even average acts, disruptive commercial and distribution strategies like the rise of the internet and technology that enable garage recording becoming a thing, and the genre wars leading to a confused and threatened industry scrambling for a new business model and abandoning certain demographics, especially rock and metal, to the new marketplace and concentrating on fungible pop and hip-hop acts for the younger generations and high-end marketing of heritage acts, which becomes much easier to do as these acts progressively die off. And right here, right now in 1990, you can see where that road is being laid out ahead of us. I'm sorry. <laughs>